Hi students, my name is Chris and I teach the only online course in English as a Second Language or ESL for politics and social science. The course is designed to help advanced or intermediate maybe ESL learners prepare for a university degree in social sciences like politics, economics, history, geography, and so on. If you want me to be your teacher, you can email me at the address in the description below, or you could just listen to these videos. This is my second video for this channel as we continue our theme of critical thinking. I studied political science for years in university. We usually abbreviate it poli-sci. So that's what I'll be saying, poli sci. By the way, as things show up here, uh, you might want to pause or, or go back and listen to me pronouncing things more than once. Because poli sci deals with theories of how political economic systems work, we spent a fair bit of time learning history. A lot of work in poli sci is a theory about how something works with reference to, with reference to means uh, talking about referring to past events. For example, you could find hundreds of theories that have been used in books or maybe in scholarly journals. Scholarly means somehow related to professors, academics. A scholarly journal is a magazine that publishes the work of scholars. Um, you could find hundreds of theories in books or scholarly journals to explain the outbreak of World War I. The outbreak is the start. Um, all kinds of theories have been used just for World War I. So when we wrote our essays in poli sci, we used a lot of history books. And the more books we read, the more different perspectives we learned. In my last video, we talked about how to question what people tell us, especially when those people want to present themselves as authorities. In this video, we'll apply our skepticism, our questioning minds of these things, to history books, and we'll read a couple of passages from useful history books. After all, historians are authorities. In most history books that I've read, the historian tells you what happened. They don't say, this is what one author says happened and here's what another author says. You often have to check the notes to find out who said what. There might even be some doubt among historians about a given fact. The book you're reading might have been written before another historian or a group of historians raised concerns about the facts it contains. There might have been lots of criticism about the research findings of these books. You should know this word critique now. Uh, critical evaluation, like criticism. Critique of a sufficiently well-known book should be pretty easy to find on Google, especially with the words critique or maybe the word review would be useful too. I personally like reading critiques of a book if I'm deciding whether or not uh, I, I might like to read it or how much I might learn from it. And of a book I'm definitely going to read so that other people can help me think critically about that book. Um, Critique isn't always correct or helpful or fair, though. We can ask all the same questions uh, about critique as we can about any authority. Why are they telling me this and why do they want me to think this way? How do they know? What are their sources? Where do they get the information from? The more you know about the field you're reading about, the easier it is for you to answer those questions. I sometimes recognize someone's name or recognize a source they're citing. In other words, uh, 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 saying where they got their information from. I might recognize the source itself, or I might recognize a flaw in their argument, but usually only in a field that I'm familiar with. If I know it well enough, I might be able to critique the work myself or critique 
someone else's critique. But if I'm not so familiar with the field, then I'll need more perspective. Part of skepticism is to take everything with a grain of salt. To not assume that what you're reading, what you're hearing, is necessarily true. If you doubt a claim someone makes, good, look it up. Proper nonfiction books cite their sources. Is it the author's original research? You can check their sources, maybe online, uh, maybe with Google Books or Google Scholar, has a lot of scholarly journals. Um, maybe just go to your nearest library. Does the source really say what the other person says it says? Does it really prove their point? Where does this book, where does the book that it's citing get its information? Is that cited? If not, maybe authors are just taking this book's claims as fact when they aren't fact. Or at least where there are questions as to how factual it is. It happens sometimes. Most academic fields have books or theories that were once considered fashionable or even untouchable, almost sacred, but have since found uh, since been found to be misleading or just plain wrong. So it's fine to be suspicious, to have doubt when you're told facts in a book and not sure where those facts came from. And you should you would write that in a in a poli sci essay. Not this happened, but that author says this happened. So while I sometimes read a full book on a historical event or period, I prefer to read overviews of history and history books. Uh, in a minute, we'll look at a couple of passages from books like that that are more overviews of other history books than a history book itself. Many books will tell you about a field of study, the whole field, there are lots of books about history that spend a lot of their time looking at what others in the field have said and saying why it's no longer considered true. That might save you reading a dozen older books and then realizing that they've been debunked or discredited. In other words, that they've been shown by someone else that, that they're wrong. But, you know, read anything you find interesting. Just apply critical thinking to it. We're going to look briefly at one uh, history book that talks about the field of history. Um, and before that, we'll look at a history book that tries to uh, change some of the myths that we've been looking for. And it's, uh, some, of, some of these are the, the kind of books that we'll be using in the ESL for politics course. Um, and by the way, I downloaded all these books from the website b-ok.org. There's a link in the description. It's an awesome place to download books for free. We'll be using these and a lot of books in the ESL for politics course that I teach, but instead of looking at whole chapters or books at a time, depending how good uh, your, your English level really is, we'll probably just look at passages or segments that can teach us something about the subject and some useful vocab, but that don't overwhelm the student, that, uh, that aren't too much for you. <clears throat> um, you might find passages like this hard. I think it, it probably will be. But you just need to learn more vocabulary, probably. Um, and that takes time, so, so don't get frustrated. You should also know that, unlike these other words in what I've been saying, I'm not going to explain all the words that you might not know. So if you want to pause the video and look up the words, that, that might be useful. Let's start with this book. 1491. Um, if the name of the book 1491 doesn't mean anything to you, 1492, so just over 500 years ago, 
was the year Christopher Columbus first sailed from Europe to the Americas, beginning the European colonization of the whole continent of the Americas. Uh, this book, 1491, is about how scholars have been so wrong about what life was like in the Americas before the Europeans invaded, so until 1491. Um, let's look where it starts. Um, empty of mankind and its works. It says, uh, what, what we'll do is we'll first read through it, um, try to understand what you can, and then we'll look at uh, some of the words. We'll kind of quickly go over what the words are, then we'll read it again so that you can understand the whole thing. Um, it was just talking about uh, a part of Bolivia called the Beni. It says, the Beni was no anomaly. In other words, it was normal, it was typical. For almost five centuries, Holmberg's mistake, the supposition that Native Americans lived an eternal, unhistoried state, held sway in scholarly work, and from there fanned out to his high school textbooks, Hollywood movies, newspaper articles, environmental campaigns, romantic adventure books, and silkscreen t-shirts. It existed in many forms and was embraced, both by those who hated Indians and those who admired them. Holmberg's mistake explained the colonists' view of most Indians as incurably vicious barbarians. Its mirror image was the dreamy stereotype of the Indian as a noble savage. Positive or negative, in both images, Indians lacked what social scientists call agency. They were not actors in their own right, but passive recipients of whatever windfalls or disasters happenstance put in their way. Okay, so again, some of this vocabulary, quite difficult, but uh, that's okay. Again, an anomaly is something unusual, like a bad example of something, but the Benny, this part uh, of the world, was no anomaly. It wasn't unusual. Um, this whole book deals with something called Holmberg's mistake, and it explains it here in this paragraph. The supposition, or the belief, the assumption, that Native Americans, in other words, the people who were there before the Europeans, or the white people, lived in an eternal, unhistoried state. Well, history, we could think of as change. History is just how things change and how things evolve in the world. And for, for five centuries, for, for, for almost all of the time of European colonization, they, the Europeans looked at the natives and said, well, no, they don't change, they've always been like this. Um, and that's because they have no agency, as we see in the last sentence there. Um, in other words, they, they, don't, they don't do anything themselves. They don't have the power to act, they just react. They just do um, whatever more powerful people told them to do. So, so that's something you can watch out for in history books, especially uh, so-called Western history books or Orientalism. We, we'll, we, we'll talk more about that in a later video. Um, this, so that was Holmberg's mistake, the belief, the supposition, that Native Americans lived in an eternal, unhistoried state. And it says that belief held sway, or it held influence, in this case, uh, in, scholarly look, in scholarly work. There it fanned out, it spread out to high school textbooks. But, and, and that's what we'll talk about in our next reading, um, but also in the popular culture more generally, right? Hollywood movies, the newspaper, um, books, and so on. <clears throat> um, you we could go down it says uh, it existed in many forms we we could see that if we look at uh, if we look at history and was embraced in other words uh, people thought it was a great idea it was embraced both by those who hated Indians that's that's kind of the old word for the natives of the Americas and those who admired them so the uh, the people who admired the natives might have thought of uh, what it says down here, the dreamy stereotype of the Indian as noble savage. 
and noble savage is it's still kind of an unhistoried state it's the idea that um things for smaller groups uh back then you know they things were good and and ideal and everything was fine it was a kind of uh garden of eden which is the the place in the bible where um they they started out the the the, the wonderful place that we're supposed to all have fallen from you know we have civilization and civilizations bad <laughs> so they ha they they were the noble savage that hasn't been corrupted by civilization yet um <clears throat> and uh as it says here that the people who hated indians found them as incurably like eternal forever vicious barbarians we're we're definitely going to see this word barbarians again in uh, in some of uh, my videos in the future for now just think of the word barbarian as meaning uh, a person who is apart from civilization this is a good example of how the the history of what we call civilization uh, has been quite a violent one and a, a history of forgetting in many way in many ways uh, so the indians lacked agency okay so I hope you understood that. Of course, you can always comment and ask if you didn't quite understand. That's okay. Uh, let's look at our next book. This next book is called Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen. Um, you can actually find him on Facebook. He's still uh, he's still uh, talking about these things. I, I've always enjoyed James Lowen's work. He, he talks a lot about bad history writing and uh, so here's a very uh, typical passage from one of his books and it says textbooks because we're talking about uh, high school textbooks in fact this whole book lies my teacher told me it's about textbooks textbooks also keep students in the dark about the nature of history history is furious debate informed by evidence and reason Textbooks encourage students to believe that history is facts to be learned. We have not avoided controversial issues, announces one set of textbook authors. Instead, we have tried to offer reasoned judgments on them, thus removing the controversy. Because textbooks employ such a godlike tone, it never occurs to most students to question them. In retrospect, I ask myself, why didn't I think to ask, for example, who were the original inhabitants of the Americas? What was their life like? And how did it change when Columbus arrived? Wrote a student of mine in 1991. However, back then everything was presented as if it were the full picture, she continued. So I never thought to doubt that it was. So let's look here. Um, what does it mean to keep students in the dark? Well, if you're in the dark, you can't see, you can't know the truth. So keeping someone in the dark is not telling them something, which could, could be similar to lying, of course. Um, about the nature of history. Here, the nature of something just means what it really is. So textbooks keep students in the dark about the nature of history. They don't tell them what history really is. History is furious. Here you could substitute maybe the word vigorous or um, uh, where, there, where there's a lot of something, a lot of debate, informed by evidence and reason. Um, but, uh, but what textbooks are saying is, is that history is just a bunch of facts. Like, just believe these facts. Um, we've tried to remove the controversy um, supposedly by by offering judgments well well who are they to offer judgments exactly that's why um, Lowen says that they employ a godlike tone in other words instead of saying there's debate on this issue or something they say this is what happened this is the truth um, so it never occurs to students they don't even think about questioning them 
Um, if you don't know, in retrospect, in retrospect means as I as I look back on my life. Um, why didn't I ask who were the original inhabitants, people who lived there, uh, of the Americas? <clears throat> okay. So um, let's go back and read the first one. We'll go here, let's see. So again, the Benny was no anomaly. For almost five centuries, Holmberg's mistake, the supposition that Native Americans lived in an eternal, unhistoried state, held sway in scholarly work, and from there fanned out to high school textbooks, Hollywood movies, newspaper articles, environmental campaigns, romantic adventure books, and silkscreen t-shirts. It existed in many forms and was embraced both by those who hated Indians and those who admired them. Holmberg's mistake explained the colonists' view of most Indians as incurably vicious barbarians. Its mirror image was the dreamy stereotype of the Indian as a noble savage. Positive or negative? In both images, Indians lacked what social scientists call agency. They were not actors in their own right, but passive recipients of whatever windfalls or disasters happenstance put in their way. To review this article, <clears throat> or this passage, I beg your pardon. Textbooks also keep students in the dark about the nature of history. History is furious debate informed by evidence and reason. Textbooks encourage students to believe that history is facts to be learned. We have not avoided controversial issues, announces one set of textbook authors. Instead, we've tried to offer reasoned judgments on them, thus removing the controversy. Because textbooks employ such a godlike tone, it never occurs to most students to question them. In retrospect, I ask myself, why didn't I think to ask, for example, who were the original inhabitants of the Americas? What was their life like? And how did it change when Columbus arrived? Wrote a student of mine in 1991. However, back then, everything was presented as if it were the full picture, she continued. So I never thought to doubt that it was. So we can see from those two passages that just because we're presented with certain facts in our history books um, doesn't mean that they truly are facts. Uh, great, so uh, let's review the rest of the vocabulary that we learned. We learned poli sci as a shortcut for political science. With reference to is when you're referring to or talking about something. We used the word scholarly, which means related to scholars. Scholarly journal is uh, very common to hear in university. It's a magazine that publishes the work of scholars. We heard the word outbreak, the outbreak of World War I. Uh, usually the start of a war could be the start of maybe a disease that spreads some other word, but Frequently, it's a war. We use the word skepticism, which is just questioning things, doubting things. We use the word critique, which uh, is used as a noun, sometimes as a verb also, um, a critical evaluation of something. I might ask a friend for a critique of this video, for example, so that I can get better at making them. Uh, to cite a source. What source does the author cite? Where do they get that information from? And who says that their source is correct? To take something with a grain of salt is to be skeptical, to not assume that just because someone tells you something that it's true. Debunked or discredited. Sometimes a historian's work can be debunked or discredited. So 
So you need more than just a grain of salt when you're reading a book like that. The word overwhelm, which is when it's just too much. So don't worry, in this ESL for politics class, uh, I won't overwhelm you. Great, thanks everyone for watching. If you're interested in taking my course or any of the other courses that I teach, please email me at the address in the description. Please hit like on this video if you learned something, comment if you have any questions at all, and subscribe for more videos just like this one every Sunday.